Good morning, guys. It's Reed Work Turbo. It's me. It's Turbo Tech Thursday on a Friday, Friday edition. Apologize about the second video not going out yesterday. Internet in Alabama did not want to play nice. So, anywho, uh, my video yesterday uh, was going to be on scavenge pumps. I have a lot of y'all guys ask me questions all the time uh, about scavenge pumps and how they should be properly plumbed. Do I like them? Why is my turbo smoking? Do I like them? Why is my turbo smoking? Um, <clears throat> starting off, it's going to be hard for y'all to believe, there are no positive oil seals in a turbocharger. Um, so there is no way, number one, that a turbo can hold oil inside of it, inside the bearing housing. And number two, there's no way that you can blow them out. So I'm going to blow that up on a whole nother video. But short and sweet, got to trust me right now. The good news is if you've had a brand new set of turbos on your car, you've mounted the turbos low and you put a scavenge pump on it, you cranked it up and proceeded to Exxon Valdez, the whole driveway, uh, all is not lost. You, you did not kill your turbochargers. Um, so... Suck up your pride, take all the housings off, get you some cleaner, uh, carb cleaner, brake cleaner, whatever you want to use, and some rags, and clean everything up really, really good. And let's start over and show you how to properly run a scavenge pump system on your turbo-equipped vehicle. All right, so my fancy skills of an artist right here. Here's your, here's your engine. Here's your turbo, obviously lower than your engine. This orange box right here is your scavenge pump. 90% of everybody out there wants to run a line straight from the bottom of the turbo and return it up to the valve cover because it's easy to do. That's the majority of the calls that I get. Obviously, you have a, let's use a different color for the feed line. We'll use yellow. Obviously, you have a marker that doesn't work. Obviously, you have a pressure line coming from the engine's oil pressure supply going into the turbo. All right, so oil in, oil out, scavenge pump, doing its sucking job, blowing it back up to the valve cover. Your installation is going to vary, but that's the general gist of it. The problem with this is um, when we get ahead of myself, let's let's talk about oil line sizing first and foremost. Regardless if you have a scavenge pump or not, you need an adequate suction side return line. So if your turbo is a T3, T4, you need a full flow dash 10 minimum. Most T3, T4s are going to call for a bare minimum of half inch inside diameter, free flow hose fittings, everything. No dash 10 fittings out there that I'm aware of meet true half inch inside diameter. Um, if you call me, I'm going to recommend uh, using... PTFE hose or, or uh, you know, thin-walled high-pressure hose that's going to give you the biggest cross-section of flow for number 10. Obviously, make sure your fittings at your turbo are the same size or larger than the opening in the bottom of the turbo and that every surface is bell mouth, polished smooth, and promotes oil flow. First thing I'm going to do is I'm going to tell everybody out there that running a line straight from the turbo to the pump is incorrect. So we're just going to get rid of it. You ask, why is it incorrect, Reed? There's a lot more going on in that drain line than you realize. Yeah, you might crank the car up at idle, and it might suck, the little sucker pump will suck itself to nothing, and it'll pull all the oil out of the turbo, and you won't have any smoking. But... Oh my gosh, you go drive it, man. You get smoke, you get oil. The reason that happens, the turbocharger's hot. The oil is hot. Uh, there are 
so many variables going on inside of this thing uh, that will be covered in future videos. Let's just say you're not only dealing with liquid oil, you're dealing with expansion of gases in the return system. As the turbo does its job, spins up everything and it gets hot. There's a very small amount of exhaust gas that finds itself into the bearing housing of the turbo. Here again, the sealed debacle that I will go over in, in the future. Um, so you have to compensate for fluid volume and gas expansion. I recommend coming off the bottom of the turbocharger and building a sump tank. The sump tank can be right on the bottom of the turbo. It can be mounted somewhere away from the turbocharger, but it is absolutely important that that box is lower than the turbocharger, but not lower than the scavenge pump. How much capacity does my box need, Reed? Um, I tell everybody, you know, if you can get eight ounces for a T3, T4, you're going to have no problems at all. I've built them as small as probably four ounces, three or four ounces. The short answer for it is the bigger the box, in most cases, the better. I mean, you don't have to build a five gallon container, obviously, but, you know, be reasonable about it. What this does is it lets everything that's coming out of the bottom of that turbo diffuse, dissipate, settle down, whatever fancy word you want to use in this enclosure. At that point, come off your sump box and go into your pump. Number two thing very important. Your pump needs to be at the same level as the drain box or marginally lower. Why you ask? Very simple. You want gravity to always favor oil flow going into the scavenge pump. You need to think of things like the forces of the car driving down the road you need to think about ride height, the pitch of the car, if the front end is way lower than the back end. Think about oil flow going downhill at all times. From the turbo to the pump, zero, I mean zero, uphill run. That is a recipe for success. That will always ensure that the pump stays primed. When the ignition is shut off, the oil will flow towards the pump and away from the turbo. There are no, when I say uphill, even this line going between between the pump and the and the box, none of this mess. Zero line cannot do that. It will trap oil in it and create more work for the pump to do that the pump already has a hard enough time doing. So, what size line do I need between my, my sump box and my pump? Well, that can be marginally smaller, marginally. So, if you've got let's say T3, T4 stuff, you've got half inch inside diameter going from the turbo to the sump box, you could run a standard number 10 or even a number eight there because it is going, the pump is going to pull ever so slightly through that line. I'm gonna tell you to overkill it. The pump manufacturer may not tell you to overkill it. There are some variables and factors that go into the distance between this sump tube and the actual pump itself. 
if you buy your turbos from me, you get your pumps from me, I will go over all of this with you and make sure that you are not going to fail. The uh, bigger turbos, S400s, GT55, GT47, GT42s, um, make this connection between the turbo and the sump tank as big as you possibly can. Um, three quarters of an inch inside diameter, killer, gone, do it. You know, the, the freer flowing that connection is, the better off you will be. And of course, my yard guys are going to come in the middle of my video after my air compressor cut on, so, you know, it's amateur hour. <laughs> um, all right, so turbo, sump tank, line, pump. All of that is in a nice downhill fashion, golden. Line coming out of the turbo or out of the sump pump, scavenge pump, Super Sucker 3000, going back to the engine. Uh, how big does it need to be? Well, obviously it needs to be big enough to handle the capacity that the pump and the turbo are going to put on it. So some people will say you can run a little smaller line and it may work a little bit better. I've tried it. Yes, you can do it if it's done properly. Again, for you guys, my customers, I will answer the questions. Make sure you're doing what you need to do. This line length is very important. This line routing is very important. Uh, it is not as important as this suction side. Get it back to the engine as efficiently as you can. If you're returning it to the oil pan, make sure you return it above oil level. You return it in a place where, where the uh, connecting rod throws or the, the crankshaft counterbalance cannot throw oil in its face and impede flow. Think about everything turning inside your engine, the windage that is created. Thought into this and not just doing what everybody else does on the internet will pay big dividends in your success. All right. Valve cover. It's always really popular for people to return it to the valve cover because it's easy. You don't have to take off your oil pan and put a fitting in it. There is a huge problem with returning it to the valve cover. Usually that distance is pretty great. So because of that distance is going to come a large volume of oil in this column that when this pump is shut off, that column of oil has nowhere to go. So it drains back. I'm not gonna get into the mechanics of all the different pumps out there. I have one pump exclusively that I like to use. I'll let you make your decision on which one you wanna use. Some pumps, Manufacturers say they have a check valve built into them or it's a positive displacement pump. Some of that is true. You need to test it and you need to be sure and clear with the manufacturer of your pump before you set this up. I'm going to tell you every installation that we do successfully right after the pump put a check valve. It'll let the oil go out of the pump. Once the pump is shut off, the column of oil that tries to drain back is checked before it can drain back. Why is this important, Reed? That oil will find its way through these gears of this pump eventually. It'll find its way through this line and it'll find its way into this sump tank. Heaven forbid that this volume of this line exceeds the volume of this side of the suction system. Because what's going to happen is it's going to push the oil to a point back up into the turbocharger. You'll cut the car off, the pump will quit running, you'll park the car, you'll come back, you'll crank it up, you will get a bunch of oil blown out of the back side of the turbo, uh, you'll get a bunch of smoke. Check valve is great insurance. While we're on the subject of check valves, the feed line needs a check valve as well. Why does it need a check valve? A lot of today's engines, when you shut the motor off, this line will siphon. So it will continually drip for a small amount of time. 
my friend Matt and I did a Dodge Viper. Uh, this has been pretty close to 16, 15, 16, 17 years ago, I guess. Didn't put check valve on either side of it. Overkilled it, put a pump on each turbo, did all this great stuff. <laughs> Shut the car off, went inside to cook a steak, came back out to the garage and there was about uh, three quarts of Brad Penn, <laughs> green oil all over the garage floor, just dripping out of the side pipes of this customer's Viper. Not exactly fun to clean up. Check valve in the feed line side, problem solved. Um, this is easily checked on your engine once you get your installation done. If you don't want to buy a check valve because they are expensive, there are ways to test, obviously, by priming the engine over, getting oil coming out of the feed line. Don't even have to hook it up to the turbo. Just put it in the relative location it's going to be for the uh, connection on the turbo. And after you're done priming the motor, sit there and watch it. If it sits there and drips, you need a check valve. If it doesn't, you don't need a check valve. You got to think of variables, parking the car on a hill, uh, the way the car is going to sit on its tires versus it on jack stands or a lift. Be mindful of all of that. Successful installations that we do in our shop, check valve on the feed line, check valve on the outlet of the pump. All right. So to recap, feed, suction side, positive pressure side. What else do we need to think about? Remember that little evil I told you about gas expansion? Well, gas expansion is a bad thing. It's the kryptonite to your pump. It's the kryptonite to your turbo. What do we do to remedy that? Put you a vent on your sump tank. Run it back up to the valve cover. This is going to do two things. It will give a gas break for the sump pump or the sump tank. Heaven forbid this pump quits working that will give some amount of return, pressurized return, back to the valve cover if that pump cannot function. Will it keep you from James bonding up the whole interstate or pumping a bunch of oil out of your turbo? Probably not, but you know it's going to cut down on the amount that happens. How big does that need to be? Again, my, my experience is big. Uh, it needs to be able to vent just like the breathers on your valve cover do. Anything you deal with there, as far as releasing pressure, you are going to take aeration out of the oil. You're going to let the pump do its job better. You're going to put life into the turbocharger. You're going to have a more successful installation. Dash four, if it's short, probably sufficient. Dash six would be better. Um, dash eight, if this is a twin turbo car and you're using one sump tank for both turbos, think about it. you got to double your capacity. All right, capacity. The, the root of 99.9% .9 of every single turbo's problem out there. When you put a scavenge pump on a turbo, oh man, my beautiful artwork. Okay. Probably didn't have to erase the pump, but you know what? It was a bad drawing anyway. Here's what I want you to do. Put you a straight drain line off the bottom of your turbo. Grab you a five gallon bucket. Pour quantity of oil into the bucket. Mark that so you know how much oil is in this bucket. That's very important. If you want to do this correctly, glue 
you a fitting into the bottom of this bucket and put your pump right off of it. And return it back to the engine. Disclaimer. If you do not understand that you can pump your engine dry of oil or you can make a mess and start a fire, I mean, I hate to say this, but you know what? I have to say it. Please don't do this. If you're smart enough to see where I'm going already with it without me talking anymore, do it. Crank it up. Let the oil flow out of the turbo into the bucket. Pump is running, obviously. Pumping back into the engine. Make sure the engine is full of oil. Watch that level with that reference mark. If anything at all that level needs to go down fairly quickly. You are idling the engine. Yes, you've got full oil pressure on the turbo. But trust me, when you sing that engine up to whatever rod fling and RPM you want to sing it to, and you send your turbo to stratospheric boost levels and your EGTs are, you know, maxed out and, and everything is just jiving and this thing's hauling butt, there's going to be a lot more coming out of that than you will ever expect. I recommend the pump outflows the idle volume of turbo delivery by at least 25%. At least. That's my bare bottom number. Well, read. how do I know which pump to buy? Well, before you ever buy the pump, get your turbo all plumbed up, put your bucket down there with no oil in it. Again, disclaimer here, do not tear your engine up on the fact that you don't know what you're doing. Crank the engine up for 30 seconds. Measure how much oil comes out of it. Is it a quart? Is it a couple of ounces? Ball bearing turbos are going to have very little oil coming out of them. A, a GT55 journal bearing or a large frame or, you know, a S400, you may have two quarts laying there depending on your oil viscosity or oil temperature, yada, yada, yada. Double that number, that'll give you flow per minute, add 25% to that, bare minimum, call your pump manufacturer that you're going to buy your pump from and say, hey, my system flows one gallon of oil per minute with your buffer in there. Your pump manufacturer should give you a little buffer as well. So they're going to say, okay, well, you need a pump that will flow a gallon and a half a minute or two gallons a minute. You see where I'm going with this? You're overcompensating for oil flow. Just because your turbo flows a gallon of oil a minute does not mean you need a gallon of oil per minute pump. You will have oil out of every orifice of your turbo and in places you didn't even know you could get oil into. All right. So we've covered how to properly size, how to properly plumb. Restrictors. This is the last thing we're going to talk about. Everybody's like, can I put a restrictor in my turbo? The answer is no. Anybody that tells you yes is not giving you incorrect information, they're just not giving you good information. Well, Garrett says put a 30 thousandths restrictor in a ball bearing turbo. 30 thousandths restrictor might work just fine for delivering enough oil flow with 5W30 oil at 200 degrees in an engine that makes 60 pounds of oil pressure. What if you're on the other end of it, you got a race car that you don't ever put oil temperature in. You do good to have 120 degrees oil temperature and you run 50 weight oil uh, because it's on alcohol or E85 or whatever 
E98 plus seven fuel you run. A fixed orifice restrictor will never be consistent in flow. Simple physics. There are days it's going to deliver too much oil, days it's not going to deliver enough oil. So if your turbo is a ball bearing model, I highly, highly recommend regulating the oil pressure to 40 PSI of inlet pressure at the turbo with the engine at operating temperature, operating oil temperature, operating everything temperature. Um, right now, Turbo Smart is, I believe, the only manufacturer that provides these. Um, obviously, your engine builder may not want to regulate the engine oil pump to 40 PSI for whatever reason. So, uh, not saying you got to go buy a Turbo Smart oil pressure regulator, but I've used them. They work great. They have not paid me, compensated me in any way, shape, or form for this video. If somebody else comes out with one tomorrow, I'm going to say that work. That'll work too. You know, test it. I'll order one. We'll we'll test it and see. Anyway, journal bearing turbos. Can I restrict them? Here again, the answer is no. Um, same reason for the ball bearing turbo, but also a bigger reason that I'm going to cover. You guessed it in another video. A journal bearing turbo requires oil volume going through the turbo to cool it. It is not necessarily a problem with lubrication. It is a problem with cooling. You go put a, you know, a 40 PSI regulator on a journal bearing turbo, nine times out of 10, it's probably going to be okay. Uh, but every journal bearing turbo that I sell, I do not recommend any type of regulation of oil pressure to it. I want optimization of oil drain, optimization of crankcase breathing, and from there we will make a decision if you need to regulate the flow of oil to the turbo. If you need to regulate the flow of oil to a journal bearing turbo, I highly recommend buying a water-cooled bearing housing as well. Um, most all T3, T4s are available with water cooling options. Um, S300, S400, uh, anything bigger than a GT45 and a Garrett, you're out of luck. But most of those are going to be race-only turbos, so we can manage the heat pretty well there. I'll go over that in another video. <laughs> um, do I sell scavenge pumps? No, I do not keep scavenge pumps in stock. I do not keep check valves in stock. I tend to stay out of that because... I will tell you to avoid a scavenge pump installation at every single cost possible. I've had more nightmare stories. I have had more nightmare experiences myself with scavenge pumps. I realize some installations are just going to require them. Um, if they are approached professionally, if they are approached with due diligence and forethought, of how the system works, you can have some success out of them. I believe I've covered everything that I would like to. Um, trying to go over everything in my head. Uh, if you would like a transcript of this video, <laughs> I'm just kidding. Uh, I do have a, uh, a PDF document on scavenge pump uh, installations. Shoot me an email, support at workturbochargers.com. Be patient with me. Give me a couple of days. I'll email you a copy of that uh, PDF file. Um, it's going to go over everything we talked about here, maybe in a little bit better order. But guys, I hope this educates you a little bit on scavenge pumps. It's a uh, it's something to be to take professionally. Consider all your variables. And your little turbo will be happy. <laughs> oh, that was awful. Anyway, hope y'all guys have a good day. Drop some comments below if you got some questions. If they're more detailed, please shoot me an email. Uh, I will be happy to discuss them with you.
Y'all guys have a great weekend. Thanks for tuning in. Oh, yeah. At Work Turbo, Facebook, Instagram, Turbo Tech Thursday hashtag. You can find all my links to my videos that way. And Work Turbo Chargers is official. That's our YouTube page. Shameless plug. Y'all have a great weekend. Talk to you later.